Okay, welcome to uh, Scaling Instagram Infrastructure. Instagram is a community where people connect with each other through shared experiences in a visual way. A bit of history of Instagram. It was founded in 2010. Less than two years later, it was acquired by Facebook. I joined Instagram three years ago and have been working on the infrastructure team since then. Fast forward to 2017, we got a new logo, and in the just last six months, uh, 100 million new users have joined the community. Since we're talking about scaling today, um, let's take a look at a typical day on Instagram. 400 million users visit Instagram every day. Four billion likes are registered. More than 100 million media is uploaded and our top account has more than 110 million followers. This is across the board four times increase in scaling than three years ago when I first joined Instagram. Back then it was a much smaller development team, the app was way simpler, and we have a lot fewer users. But it was fast growing and we were struggling to keep the service up all the time. One of the common scenes you would see on a Friday afternoon right before the weekend peak time is our on-call engineers will be staring at the computer screen, looking at the CPU load, and decide whether we need to spin up a few extra web servers for the weekend. Well, we have come a long way since that mode of operation. And so today we're gonna talk about in three dimensions of growth to enable us to scale to today's level. To scale out is to build an infrastructure that allows us to add more hardware when we need them. And to scale up is to make each of these servers count. And to scale the dev team is to enable a fast growing engineering team to continue to move fast without breaking things. <coughs> so first scale out is the ability to use more servers to match the user growth. From a few servers to quite a few in the data center to extending to multiple data centers. Instagram was running in AWS from the beginning and continued to do so after almost two years uh, with Facebook. About three years ago, it moved its service completely inside Facebook data center in order to take advantage of the, uh, some of the scaling services like uh, monitoring, uh, search, or spam. But as soon as we moved into one of the data centers, Facebook cut out the entire network access to that data center. Why? Um, Facebook takes disaster readiness very seriously. So it would routinely conduct these drills called storms on a regular basis to make sure that all our services can sustain the loss of a region and continue to serve the users in a seamless manner. Instagram architecture at the time was not able to operate in multiple data centers. So we had to tape, play the Gorilla tech lick and uh, move up with our whole service to another data center. Unfortunately, disasters are not just a theoretical hypothesis. So we needed to get ready for the next time the storm happens or the reality hits. In addition, thanks to our rapid growth, we were quickly running out of capacity in that data center. Facebook had capacity elsewhere, but we couldn't take advantage of that. Power outages and the human errors also contribute to service unreliability. Um, just a few days ago, a RM-RF type of uh, you know, operation on our container tier was wiping out quite a few of our production servers. Fortunately, we had the ability to move our traffic away from the problem data center. In case you think that this only matters to scalable services such as Instagram, here's a headline from last week, which reminds us even the world's most reliable infrastructure could still have outages at times. And if you don't have another region to fall back on, then this is a suggestion from one of the articles published. I'd say that in addition to praying uh, at the moment of this event, let's put something on the roadmap so the next time 
you, we would go business as usual. How do we get there? Let's take a look at the backend stack Instagram had at the time. At the center is the web tier that runs Django with Python. It receives user requests and accesses various backend storage or services for responding to the user. A user request could also trigger some asynchronous tasks that are done uh, uh, in the, in the backend. Uh, for example, sending notification to the person whose photos you liked. These tasks are sent to RabbitMQ and Celery for processing. So how do we distribute this stack to different data centers? We identified two categories of servers or services, storage versus computing. Storage servers store global data that needs to be consistent across multiple data centers with replication, perhaps with some latency, but eventual consistency. Computing servers are usually stateless. They process requests uh, by user uh, uh, traffic. The data in these servers are temporary, and they can typically be reconstructed from the global data. Using these two criteria, we now revisit our stack to see what fits where. We use Postgres servers to store user, media, friendship type of data. And a typical uh, deployment in one region is a master with multiple replicas to support high rate of read RPS. The web server would write to the master where data gets replicated, but the reads typically happens on a replica. When going to multiple data centers, it's pretty straightforward with cross-region uh, uh, replication. The Django continues to write to the master, possibly cross-region, but typically only needs to read from a local region. To address the increased latency for writing, we did make modification to minimize the round-trip time for writes by batching requests wherever it's possible. The increased latency between the master and replica turns out to not have been a big problem for us. Next, we use Cassandra to store user feeds, activities, etc. In Cassandra, there's no master. All replicas have the same copy of data with eventual consistency. Consistency can be configured based on application's tolerance for inconsistency, scalability, uh, service availability, and latency. So for example, uh, one application could choose to have write uh, consistency of two and read consistency of one. Going to multi data center again is pretty straightforward. You can have the replicas living in uh, different data center. On the computing side, we group Django and Rabbits and a Celery into one pod that goes in each region. The global load balancer would balance, uh, send a user request to Django's, but the uh, asynchronous task would be produced and consumed in the same region. That gets us uh, over here, database replication across region and computing resources all in containing one region but we have left out memcache. Memcache is a huge part of the scalability story. It is a high performance key value store that front ends the database tier without which the databases would be crumbling under the read demand. It provides millions of operations per second on each of the servers. Because of such high rate of services, it is very sensitive to network conditions, so latency is a big deal. As such, cross-region read-write is prohibitive. So our architecture decided that we will not provide a global consistent memcached here. The work set in e the memcached in each region is determined by user traffic served out of that region. Let's see what problem it might cause. As a user comes in making a comment on the media that gets into, uh, where it gets into um, inserting the Postgres server, the memcache also gets updated by the Django server. Well, another reader comes in, 
Another user comes in and comes fetch his feed. He's going to use the same memcached here where the commenter was. So he's going to get the latest comment. No problem when both users are served out of the same region. When we go to two different regions, it could be a problem. Since we hash the user request based on a user ID, the two people sitting next to each other could be served out of two different data centers. Let's see what happens in that case. Again, the user C makes a comment, data gets, uh, gets inserted into the Postgres server. Memcache is updated locally in that region, but it does not update the memcache in the, data, in the other data center. So even though the comment is replicated in the Postgres server, nobody is invalidating the memcache in the second data center. The user comes in, getting his feed, is going to get a stale comments of the media. Well, it's not a great user experience and could cause a worse consequence than just social awkwardness. So how do we fix the cache inconsistency problem? As user comments comes in, again, we insert into the Postgres database, but we're not going to update the memcache from Django. Instead, we use the Postgres replication mechanism. And we run a daemon on each of the Postgres replicas that tails the database updates. And it then invalidates the memcache in its own local region. Now, when the user R comes in and reads the feed, it's going to be forced to go to memcache, uh, be forced to go to Postgres because memcache does not have that entry anymore. Now the user gets the latest comments. While it solves the stale memcache problem, it creates a big load on the Postgres server. Let's see why. This is a picture that has received 1.2 million likes. How do we get this number to display to the user? <clears throat> so we have a table that stores what user <clears throat> liked which media and we will do a select, select count star on that table. And this is going to take hundreds of milliseconds to execute. It wasn't a big deal in the past because the, cache, the like counter was cache and memcache, and every like would just do a memcache increment. So there is rarely any need to go to the database to retrieve this counter. But now, because we invalidated this counter for every like that uh, registers, all these reads after the, the a like would have to be forced to go to the database. So to fix this, we created a denormalized table that stores just the media and the number of likes. Instead of going through a select count star, we just do an index lookup on this table. That reduced the execution time of this query to tens of microseconds, many orders of magnitude faster than the previous query. However, even in this case, the load is still high. You've heard a thundering heart problem in the morning uh, on, the, on the Facebook Live uh, problem. This is very similar. When cache is invalidated, there's no such counter in the memcache, then all the Django's coming in would have to go to the database. Even with reduced query time, it's still a lot of load on the database. So we use memcache lease to solve this problem. Here's how it works. The first Django that tries to read from the memcache, instead of doing a normal get, it does a lease get, and memcache returns Instead of a miss, it says, I don't have the data, but you have my permission to go to the database. The second Django comes in within a shorter period of time, does a same lease get, and instead of getting a miss, it's told, I don't have the data, but don't go to the database. I have a stale value for you. You can use it, or you can wait to uh, you know, retry to get the latest data. In most of our application cases, the still value would uh, be completely valid. So if you get a million likes versus a million plus 10 for user experience, it's got, are not going to be very different. The first Django then goes to the database, 
and uh, update the memcache. Subsequent reads would be able to get the most updated value. Now with these improvements, the database, even though it's still getting higher load than before, it's able to handle the load now. And with the building, the computing building blocks and the replications for Postgres and Cassandra, we were able to build up and extend Instagram into as many data centers as we need to. With that, we now have capability wherever we need it, and service is more reliable, and we're original failure ready. But we're actually not everywhere. Uh, we're mostly in North America right now because the latency from Europe and Asia is still very high. So, but we also see opportunities there. Um, with the latest uh, features that we, are ha we have for direct messaging and live streaming, we have identified uh, a more and more users uh, with more localized social network, whether it's celebrity, whether it's you know, a, a group of friends who are in a particular region in Asia, it makes sense to move the data center closer to where users are to reduce this interaction uh, latency. So that would be something that we would like to tackle next. While it is great that we have the ab ability to add more servers when we need them, we realize we were needing them too fast. While our user growth was healthy, our server growth was far outpacing the user growth. And if we had grown at this space, um, at this pace, uh, you know, since two years ago, we would be running three, four times the servers that we do now. So I really like this quote from last QCon. Um, so when we talk about scale up, we don't mean to buy more expensive hardwares, right, with more CPUs, memories, and stuff like that. Rather, what we mean is <clears throat> to use as few CPU instructions as possible to achieve something, meaning writing good code to reduce the CPU demand on our uh, infrastructure, and to also use as few servers as possible to execute, uh, to carry out those CPU instructions. That's to increase the supply that each particular server has. Effectively, each server would be able to serve more users. That's what we call scale up. So let's take a look at the demand side first. We'll go over how we measure the CPU demand, how we analyze where it comes from, and how we optimize where it matters. Let's start with collecting some data. So Linux provide perf event ABI for applications to retrieve CPU instructions for code segments. So we sample user requests and collect these CPU instructions for specific requests, along with tons of metadata, such as what's the endpoint, which data center they're running it from, what kind of hardware they're running it on, so that we can slice and dice on various dimensions. So here is a time series uh, representation of CPU instruction usage by various endpoints. We then implement a set of tools to monitor this metric and alert when, the, when it increases uh, above certain threshold. For example, this way. With this jump in the time series representation, we can then match with the event log to see what are the possible causes. Is it a diff that's rolled out? Is it uh, some configuration changes or some uh, backend service rollout? Another very important piece of metadata that we log is whether a specific feature is on or off in a request. This is very critical for us to detect increased CPU instruction demand by a newly added feature whose global impact may not be very easily seen from the previous uh, graph because it's still to a very small audience, but its impact is amplified with this metadata. And with having this data, we, we add this information right next to the UI where the feature is configured. So when the, uh, even if the, uh, the feature is rolled out to 1% or less, uh, this graph shows an eight, more than 8% CPU increase if the feature was rolled out to 100%. So this gives the developer plenty of time to address uh, the regression before it becomes a real problem. 
This way we make the performance part of the development cycle rather than an uh, afterthought. But we still get you know, innocent looks from developers who say, hey, you know, my div is only one, log, one line of log change. You know, can't possibly be causing 20% CPU instruction for a particular endpoint. So now it's time to develop some tools to deep dive into the code base. For that, we use a Python C profile. C profile provides performance statistics at function level with uh, code graph information, very much like how Linux perf works. The resulted data can be pre, uh, post processed and rendered with gprof to dot, which is an open source tool. Using this, you can look at the function and see its overall impact on your code path, the caller colleague relationship, and it help you focus on where you really want to spend your effort in optimizing. In the past, we already have this, right? This is all open source. Um, well, some of our uh, engineers have uh, you know, used these tools to, to dive into specific performance problems. But the cost of this uh, C profiling is pretty high. And the uh, process of enabling, disabling is manual. And the prospect of messing with a, a production server uh, to collect this data is pretty scary for most developers. As our development team grows, uh, this, is, this did not scale. So we needed to make the performance data readily available for more developers to access. So we instrumented C profile collection in our production server continuously. Uh, it is a conscious uh, trade-off between cost of collecting this data and the visibility we would gain into uh, our get data, uh, code base. With this instrumentation at any time, our engineers can just run one command line and generate a call graph like what we saw before. And it greatly improved their product productivity when uh, debugging performance issues. While well, snapshot was great um, when looking at the overall picture, but it doesn't help a great deal when you look at regression. So we also put this data in a time series format. So if a caller is making multiple calls to other functions, but you see matching regression in the CPU instruction, you can be pretty sure that in fact, that 20% regression is caused by the one line change of logging. So it's time to spend some effort on that. With the profile running everywhere, we also integrated this data into code browsing that shows how many servers would be needed just to run that function. This is a great reminder for anybody who's looking at our code, um, the optimization uh, opportunities. So now, let's take a look at some of the optimization we've done with all the visibility we have in the code base. Here's one example. When you load up the Instagram uh, feed, uh, we re the servers return a number of uh, URLs to the clients. Uh, with each URL is the C CDN where the client needs to go retrieve the media. This URL generation is based on the media as well as the user, where the user is from. So we can generate the most optimal CDN uh, location for the user. As we started to support a variety of mobile devices with varying capabilities, there was need to generate multiple of these URLs so the devices can choose what's the best user experience they could serve, depending on network condition, the particular device the user has. So we started to uh, give multiple URLs to uh, the mobile devices. The only difference, though, is really the size of the media. But as we were implementing this feature, we were calling the generation of the URL function four times rather than uh, once and with just different uh, varying sizes. With the help of C profile, we understand this is what's happening. So the first thing to do is less. Instead of generating, calling this function four times, uh, we call it once and simply overwrite the size function. 
This is one simple example, but we have numerous such examples with the, uh, the, the uh, visibility into the code base. We know exactly what is happening, and we were able to do a lot of these optimizations uh, very quickly. But you might also ask, okay, if the URL generation is so costly, how about we make it less costly? And you would be right. So another major theme of optim optimization opportunity was um, that we identify a number of uh, functions that are ex used extensively, um, that are pretty stable. There is not a whole lot of uh, iteration on top of it. And we Cythonize uh, these functions or use C++ implementation to speed up uh, the execution. And we were able to gain significant CPU instruction uh, to reduce the CPU instruction needs on that front. So that's the part of controlling demand. Well, let's look at the second aspect of scaling up. Given certain CPU demand, how do we make each server execute more? Ideally, we want to all the multi-cores on the server to be put to use, and we do that by running many worker processes in parallel that process user requests. But the number of processes is upper bounded by system memory. Let's take a look uh, how the memory layout looks like. We run n parallel processes, where n is greater than the number of uh, CPU cores on the system. Each process has two parts of memory, the shared part and the private part. Total system memory is made of this one shared memory and all the private memory uh, added up together. So how, how can we reduce the amount of memory requirement so we can run more processes? Upon analyzing the memory configuration, we found that code itself is a big part of where our memory went. So the first things we did was to reduce the amount of code in memory. We started to run optimize, which may be obvious, but we were not run, running with minus O. Now doc strings is gone from, uh, from our memory. The second part is to remove, remove dead code. Uh, we, we develop new features uh, very rapidly, and there is a lot of legacy uh, things that are not, uh, you know, despite the best effort from developers, there are gonna be old code laying around. So with C profile data, we were able to identify what are the code that's never get executed in our code base. And we, we're, we're in the process of automating this uh, code removal process. The second part is if we could move some of the private memory into shared area where only one copy is needed, then we would, able to, uh, we would be able to reduce the total memory needs. Since configuration data is the same for all processes, it makes sense to move them to shared memory. So again, this is a, a bit of a trade-off. You can see uh, between, you know, if you put in the shared memory, then the access to the shared memory is gonna be a bit more costly than if it's in a private memory. Uh, so you need some kind of metric to, to measure the, the trade-off, whether uh, it makes sense for you to do that. The second part where we shared more is we actually disabled garbage collection for Python. This helped to prevent some code being moved to private part for GC purposes. Um, it's not super intuitive, but uh, so we have a great blog post on this, uh, what we found, um, and Python community is actually looking into how it can make GC uh, more effective without moving memory into private part. So with these memory changes, we were able to uh, actually get uh, more than 20% capacity increase because we, uh, increase the uh, CPU instruction that we could execute on each server. Well, network can also negatively impact scale up of uh, a server. Our Django processing model is synchronous. Um, each process can only serve one request at a time. Um, so while it waits for external services uh, to respond, uh, it can cause server starvation and fewer CPU instructions get executed. As our application become more sophisticated, we are depending more and more on these external services and this be becoming a bigger problem. One example uh, is um, like this. Um, on our home feed, 
we now have stories, feed, and sometimes even suggested users on the same screen. This has greatly increased the latency for home feed retrieval. However, we also found that these services are typically independent of each other. So instead of sequentially accessing these backend services, we explored using asynchronous I.O. to access them simultaneously and greatly reducing the latency for, for, the, for the, this particular endpoint. Not only does it improve user experience, it also helps to mitigate server starvation problem and increase the uh, capacity of the user. So conclude by um, optimizing memory and network access, we were able to make each server serve more CPUs. There are still work to do as well. Although Cython and C++ were great, they are not as uh, debugging friendly as Python. So we would like to find a generic faster runtime solution for Python using JIT, for example, keeping the ease of programming and debugging as well as the runtime efficiency. We're looking at asynchronous web framework so that we can remove more of our dependency and in, in, uh, on the external services and improve the resilience. With newer Python version and better memory analysis tool, we also hope to gain more visibility uh, into the memory utilization as we do with the CPU utilization so we can further improve the memory uh, footprint. And there are many other interesting opportunities that we are going to as well. Last but not least, uh, scaling the dev team. So, Instagram um, has an interesting uh, combination of workforce. We have about 250 uh, engineers, with 30% of them joined in the last six months. We have interns throughout the year who ship numerous features with us in their three months uh, working at Instagram. We have Hackamanther from Facebook that works with us uh, for four, four weeks on specific projects. And we have boot campers who uh, sign up for Instagram tasks that gets done in two, to, two days to one week. So as, as you can see, their familiarity with our uh, system and the ramp, ramp up time would vary, but not a lot. But we're shipping features rapidly. And each of these features would require some data to be stored somewhere, right? So when a product engineer starts to work on a feature, here are the questions that she needs to answer. As you can see, this is a pretty heavy process that each small feature has to go through. And we don't give people a lot of run part time, like we said. As the team grows and the number of features grow rapidly, it is a big burden on the infrastructure engineers to babysit this process. And it's a slowdown for product engineers to de deliver their uh, feature. So what we really want is an architecture that would automatically handle caching and that allows the developers to define relations and not uh, worry about detailed implementations. It should be self-serve by product engineers and the infrastructure engineers would just worry about scaling this service. Turns out we have this uh, infrastructure at Facebook called Tau. It's basically database plus write through cache. It still uses a relational database, MySQL, as the backend storage devices, but it allows only very simplified data model. It basically uh, the nodes with objects and the edges with relationships. It may not be the most efficient as we used to have with, in terms of you know, how you store the data or you can't make direct uh, sophisticated queries in the database itself. But it does the most basic things at very large scale. And this simplified data model allowed engineers to ship new features at a much faster speed without breaking things. This is just one of the examples where we'll continue to develop better data modeling and API to increase developer velocity. So where are these features getting developed? A typical source control at uh, some companies with complex features will probably look like this. 
Right? Master will continue to contain um, incremental changes with smaller features perhaps, but branches are created to uh, develop larger features, such as in our case, live or direct messaging. The problem with having the branches is that engineers need to be mindful of the code base they're working with and do mental uh, contact switching. And there's branch management overhead. Surprises will arise when different teams work on different branches with overlapping code base. It makes it harder to do major upgrade or refactoring, like the data model simplification that we, uh, we, we showed before. Performance data would be discovered much later in the development cycle and would be much harder to fix. So instead of branch management model for various features, we adopted the webmaster approach. With no branches, every diff needs to be to keep master working. So it's a continuous integration process. Engineers can collaborate much more easily. Um, they don't have to think which, uh, which uh, repo or which branch uh, the, uh, a particular uh, feature is being developed on. It's much easier to bisect problems and revert diffs when necessary. And we can continue to monitor uh, performance uh, for all features at the same time with pretty minimum overhead. But if every feature is being worked on in master, how do we ship the code? So we use gates to control who will be exposed to new features. Typically at the beginning, only a few collaborators in engineering would be uh, seeing the feature. And the dog footers will test the feature still under active development, giving feedback so that the engineers can iterate on it. And then employees are the next victims before we develop this to the world. With this model, we know the feature works. Uh, but we don't know if it'll still work when 400 million people start to use it the next day. Sometimes between employee and the world, you know, it takes one day to one week time. So we don't know whether the database can support the increased read-write RPS. We don't know whether Django has this much CPU capacity and, you know, whether the network has, uh, will become a bottleneck. So what we also do is uh, load test. We make up artificial load that are semi-triggered by user requests. We would make assumptions about uh, you know, how many users would be using this feature, what type of load they would be generating, and we would exercise the backend infrastructure in this process. This helped us to prepare backend capacity to ensure a smooth launch of a new feature. So we're ready to launch. We need a release branch, right? Let's see, how often do we ship um, the code? Once a week, um, what do people think? Once a day, how about once a day? So we continuously roll out our master repo whenever a diff is checked in. This results in about 40 to 40 rollouts a day. A typical uh, commit will go out within an hour of landing in master. How do we make sure it doesn't all break loose, right? So code review unit test is very, very important. Um, we're not perfect at unit testing, but we do our best. Uh, most, uh, in one of our major uh, recent upgrades, uh, unit test was a, you know, a great help in capturing uh, majority of our use cases and then we were able to bring up the service right away. Um, once code is committed, it does a, another set of unit tests because, you know, you can all say diff on top of diff may not work. The next is production canary. Um, before the code is rolled out to the whole production tier, we actually run it on a few, a few production servers and compare the uh, exception rates uh, and uh, uh, 500, 200 rates with a, uh, the controlled tier. Uh, and if this uh, canary tier is generating a higher than threshold uh, failure, then we would stop rolling this out to the world. And finally, uh, we roll it. 
But even despite this, you know, uh, a lot of uh, tooling and canarying, um, we still might uh, have problems in production. So extensive monitoring and alerting system helps us to discover problems fast. And um, sometimes we do need to revert. Okay, to wrap it up, we have covered three dimensions of scaling Instagram, scaling out, um, use more hardware, scaling up, use less hardware, and scale the dev team to, for velocity and productivity. Now our uncle experience is a little bit different now. But it's not all rosy. Um, scaling is continuous effort, right? There's no one end point where we say we're done. Um, as you can see from my previous slides on the challenges and opportunities, we continue to tackle uh, interesting scaling problems at the next level. Scaling is multidimensional. So you want to look at different angles and, and make your servers all count. And scaling is everybody's responsibility, not just infrastructure and efficiency team. Now, we're not the policers, but we're the um, enablers, right? The, I think uh, uh, in, in some, I've got questions before, um, you know, how do you make the rest of the team be more efficiency uh, driven? Um, I think, you know, the deep belief in um, helping each other is, uh, is really making a, a difference here. So, questions? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have 10 minutes for questions, if people have any. Oh, there's, I'm gonna go back there. Sorry, I'm just curious, could you tell us a little bit about where you do your feature load testing? Is it actually done in a production environment or non-production? Thank you. Um, feature development does go to a production, except it's gated and it's not uh, exposed to the user. Is that your question? Load testing. Load testing. Uh, it, it's done in production. Hi, thanks for the talk. With this volume of distributing continuous deployment, uh, how do you conduct the acceptance test? You know. The canary. Uh, do, do, do you have a, a canary is the automation? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, so we measure the rate of uh, 500 versus 200 errors. Uh, and, and this is just one example. We have a number of metrics, uh, both in terms of the error rate, the exception rate, uh, in some cases even the CPU utilization, the requests uh, to the back end. If, you have, if your diff is generating a ton more requests to the back end than your uh, control system, um, it could still be an indication of a, a bad diff. And in this case, uh, the, the text is no longer too much, uh, you know, or test talk, they half hour for every... How long is the canary? Yes. Um, it's not long. Uh, it's a couple minutes. Because each of server, it, you know, they do serve quite a bit of uh, traffic in here. Um, we, have, we have to trade off between the time it takes to canary the diff and, and how we roll out the code fast. The faster you roll out the code, the more you, you can roll out, the, the easier it is to be able to identify which diff is actually causing the problem. Thank you. Excuse me, are there any downsides to everyone working on master and how do you effectively gate the features as well? I'm sorry, could, could you? Sorry, yeah. Um, are there any downsides to all the developers working on master and how do they sort of gate their features within that, that single branch? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, we have seen many downsides in terms of uh, Gating. There is a risk where, you know, if you misconfigure, the feature could be prematurely uh, exposed to the world, and it has happened, unfortunately. So, um, but when it happens, we develop more better tools. We also canary the gates uh, as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you're um, deploying into your live environment 40 to 60 times per day. So how, how long does it take to roll out a new version to all your live servers? Um, do you mean between commits and rollout? 
Uh, no, if you're just saying, okay, now deploy to all the servers, how mm -hmm. long does it take? Oh, how long does it take? Oh, okay, 10 minutes? To all the data Yeah. Uh, how many servers is it? Uh, about over 20,000. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hi, I, I was just wondering, could you talk a little bit about your, your training culture and how you bring on your new young engineers? You, you mentioned that there was quite a few new starters in the last uh, six months. Um, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Yeah, I, I was just wondering what the training culture is like. Is it just learn on the job? With oh, with the training, the tra training culture, oh. yeah. Um, so Facebook engineers typically go through a boot camp. So there we, uh, we have training on uh, basic Facebook infrastructure uh, uh, software pieces and, and deployment and things like that. Um, Instagram has its own um, boot camp courses. Um, so, uh, and, and then it's uh, basically the POC, the point of contact for specific tasks. Uh, those are for boot campers. For, uh, for hack monthers, you know, who, people who have already worked at uh, Facebook, Instagram for a while, then it's a lot easier uh, to understand the rest of the architecture. Um, in interns, you know, obviously have longer time, so uh, they typically have their mentors working closely with them. Um, that helps a lot. I had a question. Um, so, uh, the database rollback, like a database in data center two, you need to, it has an issue, the master, you have to promote the yes. slave. How mm -hmm. quick is that? Um, we were able to promote uh, a slave. It, so uh, when we were uh, still managing Postgres, obviously from the um, last slides, we, we don't anymore. We, uh, we did not do automatic master slave promotion. So once we detect a master going down and we uh, promote a slave, then it takes uh, less than a minute to promote. So during your data center, like where they, they do the storms, it's sort of fake, right? Because do they alert yes. people that so, hey, we're about yes. to do this? We don't do, we don't do real cutoff. We do promote servers before we cut off, yes. And what do you do now? Is just pure Cassandra? So we, uh, we use Tau, which is also a relational database. Um, so uh, again, it's, it's like you say, it's not a real cutoff without warning. Uh, so you have masters with massive rights failures and things like that. That doesn't happen. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we do have also Cassandra replicas and we need to prepare for the storm. Uh, you know, obviously we, in a real disaster, people would be more forgiving if there are, are more massive rights failures. Uh, but in a normal case, we don't want to impact the user experience on a regular basis, right? So, uh, but uh, other than the databases, almost everything else is, uh, is um, automatic uh, drain. I had one more question, unless someone else has. We, we have uh, the, the computation. Can you just, uh, because you're doing like basically picture conversions, right? For, that's what's taking the CPU most of the time, or? Yeah. Uh, can you just delay it? Like, let's say I upload a photo and your CPUs are bound. Can you just delay that computation so that my readers... So the computation don't... is not done at upload time. It's actually done by at read time. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Oh. Oh. I have another question. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, in the very long term, is Instagram considering uh, biting the bullet and converting its backends to use the same one as uh, Facebook to deduplicate, you know, ins infrastructure work and all that stuff? Do you mean Python versus PHP? Um, yeah, to use PHP hack. You know, yeah. Kind of so um, right now we don't have uh, much incentive to do that. We have a lot of business logic built into uh, the code base. Most of the backend access, for example, accessing Tau is already in C++ that is used by both uh, PHP and, and Python. So, um, yeah, so right now we don't have it. And, and using Thrift, you can use any, uh, to, to access backend services, you can use Python or, or PHP, it doesn't really matter. Performance-wise, um, we are looking, uh, we, we, we have just converted to Python 3, which gained us uh, quite a few, uh, percentage of performance gain. As Python uh, is being active de developed, 3.6 versus 3.5 also has performance gain. We're also looking at, uh, as I was saying, the runtime uh, JIT uh, optimization. 
that, uh, that hopefully could give us more uh, CPU efficiency. Thank you. Uh, I do actually also have a question. Uh, part of it you already answered, um, you're using Python 3. The, um, I was also curious about uh, your usage of Cython. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you use it, do you implement, um, because you mentioned you also use C and C++. Do you actually implement stuff in C, C++, or do you use Cython to interface to existing libraries? And if you, if you write new C, C++ code, what's in your experience the, the performance difference between plain C, C++, and Cython? Um, we use both, actually. So uh, in, especially for the code that is shared uh, to uh, access backend by both the Facebook front end and our back, uh, our front end, uh, we use C++ because that will go for both. Uh, but in many libraries that we use in uh, Python itself, we use Python to, uh, to, to do it directly without uh, using C++. Um, in terms of performance, I, I'm not sure I, I can now give you a number. I don't think we have actually done like Apple to cap Apple comparison with the same module being implemented in C++ versus Python. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, in my experience, it's, it's about 2% what I found. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you.